ഓണറബിൾ ഗവർണർ വെൽക്കം ടു ഏഷ്യൻ ന്യൂസ് താങ്ക് യു വെരി മച്ച് അപ്രീഷിയേറ്റ് യുവർ ടൈം താങ്ക് യു it is our 75th year of independence but right now we are seeing students on the streets protesting demanding the right to wear a piece of dress how do you view that well as far as the question of students being on the street that on only shows that india is a truly democratic country and the largest democracy in the world you everybody is free uh you are free to express yourself you are free to express whatever you feel are rightful demands you are even free to make demands which are not fair so it only speaks about the strength of indian democracy so hijab is not burqa and most muslim women wear it do you think your comments earlier it say then this is a problematic thing hijab is not burqa hijab is a term which has been used in quran on seven in seven verses or on seven occasions burqa is also a dress so at the time when the uh muslim law started uh, taking a definite shape they have used hijab for all kind of dresses which are which are associated with women and the truth is that quran does not use it in the context of the dress of women quran uses the word khimar khimar if you look at lisanul arab that is the arabic dictionary then khimar has been defined or translated as scarf as a cloth which women carry with them and what quran says and then again there is a context the context is that in those times almost every society was divided between two sections one were free people free men and free women and the others were slave men and slave women most of the economies if you study most of the economies of those times were slave driven economies now there is there was a specific instance in madina where a free woman when she was going to market some people tried to molest her naturally it gave rise to some kind of fistica for or the members of the family of that lady came there these people who had tried to molest the women that particular woman they took the plea that they were under the impression that she is a slave woman the morals of the times were such that they thought that, that it is okay if you misbehave with a slave woman after this incident and this is mentioned in all books almost all commentators have mentioned this after this particular incident a verse was revealed in quran which said that the khimar which you use draw it over your jilbab although it has been translated that the this cloth you draw over your bosoms but jilbab does not mean even bosom translation literal it means jilbab means the loose men's upper garment is called kameez and women's upper garment because it used to be loose garment 
curves of the body should not be noticed so it has been said that pull your scarf over your kameez jilbab which has been taken to mean cover your bosoms so quran does not and that too in a particular you know this was a part, after a particular incident today world over slavery does not exist united nations declaration of human rights is there uh, we have our own fundamental rights every person be a woman or a man they are all free today the context has disappeared but never forget that quran also talks about a tendency among the arabs where they used to bury the girl child soon after the birth quran says wa innal mawudatun suilat bi ayyi zambin qutilat which means that when god will ask this young child on the day of judgment for what crime you were buried god is asking god knows everything in order to highlight the seriousness of the crime this is how it has been presented in quran that god will ask this young infant child who was buried for what crime you were buried so in a way quran put a put a stop eradicated the practice from among the arabs but the mindsets are not going to change the the young infant girl being buried alive that was given up but then new terms were found hijab i feel is also one of them because nowhere in quran the word seven times i have told you the word has been used it has it has not been used in the context of the dress what dress a woman should wear so, so sir, i don't think that uh, the time has come for the women to throw away the hijab it is not question of throw away you know i am again i am i am i believe in freedom i believe in liberalism i believe in openness every person has right to decide what she or he wants to wear as long as it does not offend the public sensitivities i am not for what one should throw what one should wear it is not for me to decide it is not for you to decide it is for the person to decide what she or he they want to wear so so there has been a re-reading of islam from the continuation of what you were saying to the earlier questions answer there has been a re-reading of islam of being in islam like certain traditions and customs are returned or reinvented like the way hijab was reinvented in the recent years no not in recent year it was done it was done uh the it is started being introduced at the time when the followers of this young religion overtook both the existing empires in the neighborhood there were two empires the roman empire which was known as byzantine empire the iranian empire which was known as sassanid empire barely 12 years after the death of the holy prophet the arabs took over both these empires now keep in mind that arabs considered themselves culturally civilizationally inferior to the Byz- both the byzantines and the iranians they took over the empire now they became the conquerors and the term which has been used in quran ahli kitab for the particularly for the jews and christians what does that denote it denotes they are the people who have the knowledge who have the learning whereas we do not have so the conquerors because they had this this thing in their mind therefore 
although they had conquered them they started imitating them in cultural matters they started adopting the cultural values of the conquered people and the byzantines and the sassanid both if you read history they used to take great pride in the fact particularly the elite of that society that our women do not step outside our women do not work our women live a comfortable luxurious lives they manage at the most with the help of the uh, servants they manage the home only they used to take great pride in that justice amir ali his book spirit of islam is considered a classic he was judge of the calcutta high court and all all uh, uh, sects of muslims uh, this book is is universally acceptable as true rep- representation of the muslim history and muslim religious cultural uh, ethical values justice sayyid amir ali in his book has written that although they had started imitating the cultural values of the uh, of the sassanids iranians and the and the byzantine empire was christian empire they had started this but arab women were resisting because they were always uh, you know, their culture was different they uh, possibly as far as physical labor is concerned they did more than men and even when the arabs fought among themselves both sides used to take their women with them who will uh, play music who will sing very very motivational songs they even in the battlefield they used to be playing so they were resisting but but during the reign of walid ii uh he who was an umvi empire he was the kind of man who used to go to market only to sport beautiful girls women and from there he will try he will pursue them up to their homes so justice amir ali says that it was because of wali they have already tend to imitate the Uh, the uh, byzantines and the sassanid that had already started but it became a necessity during the reign of walid who used to chase these women harass them and then will try to take them into his harem so you are saying the political narrative of islam changed over uh, naturally but- naturally 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 everybody admits that so that is the history it has not happened recently in this like i will give you another you know before i come to the other point uh, I, i i must also remind you that i have said earlier that they used to feel culturally and civilizationally the jews and christians particularly they thought they are more civilized more cultured and among jews there was there is a, even today there is a sect who are called orthodox jews the orthodox jews for the orthodox jews the hair of the women on her head they are like her private parts a jewish orthodox jewish woman will never display her hair she always uses a cloth which looks like a turban and in public when she appears up like other parts of the body which are considered private her hair is also covered so and here this trend had started that they are culturally superior therefore we we must adopt their practices that has also played a part in it so your statements based on your deeper understanding of the holy book is often criticized or opposed by indian union muslim league and other muslim organizations sir how are they opposing this based on the same quran you believe in i 
I shall be extremely thankful to them and uh, uh, I do not know how to put it. If they quote one verse from the Quran, they only say we are saying on the basis of Quran, but they have never in I am seeing this since 1986, since Shabano case. In fact, they had painted me so black in the early years that uh, nobody was ready to listen to me. But when things, how things started changing, the Muslims started asking these people, Jews, they said, you say he speaks against Islam, but he is always quoting Quran, whereas you never quote Quran. So, I do not want to uh, indulge in this debate with the political parties. That is not my job. But one thing I can tell you, they only use the name of the Quran. They never quote from the Quran. If they quote it, I am not challenging them. I will go to them. I will say sorry for whatever I have spoken and I will thank them for educating me. So you mentioned earlier about uh, turbans. So my question is, can a state prescribe uh, some religious practices as essential or non-essential? If I'm mistaken, if I'm not mistaken, you earlier pointed out that some essential religious practices like the turbans for six that can be allowed. No, so th this is not what I have said. What I have said is, that we have a provision in our article which ensures freedom of conscience, which means freedom of faith, freedom of religion. Now, everything is included in religion. And you can claim anything that it is part of your faith. So, Supreme Court has already laid down the essential practices test where the protection of the state will be available. They will look into the matter and if they find that something is essential, intrinsic, integral to the practice of the faith, then that whether it is a custom, whether it is a ritual, whatever it is, it must receive state protection. Islam don't go by my opinion, don't go by the opinion of the others. Islam itself has laid down what are the essential, intrinsic and integral principles or pillars of Islam. Number one is affirmation of faith, which is called kalma e shahadat where you declare you believe in one God, you believe that Muhammad is the messenger of God. Second, offering prayers at regular intervals. Third, fasting for a month in one year. Fourth, charity. Although the general practice, in fact, people do not even know that Quran does not prescribe 2.5% out of your income. It is only the jurists who have decided this amount. That whatever you earn, whatever is your wealth, 2.5% must be spent on poor, on deprived, on widows, on orphans. What Quran says? Quran says, clearly Quran says, Vayas aluna kamaza yunfiqoon. People ask you how much they should spend. Kulil Afwa say to them anything and everything which is beyond your own personal needs. Quran does not say 2.5%. It is only the jurists who have decided 2.5%. Quran to say that you should not acquire wealth. You whatever wealth you acquire, you spend on the poor. For that, they will not say that it is essential. Quran, Quran disapproves luxurious living. It says that, Quran does not say, the prophetic tradition says that whatever I am doing, I am working hard during the day. I earn some money. I buy food with that money. 
for my family and myself but before partaking that food if i do not ensure that nobody in the neighborhood of 40 houses is hungry then partaking of that food which has been bought with hard earned money becomes prohibited for me they don't talk about it they talk only about things which if you ask me are non issues so coming to the uniform civil code uh, like uh, these protests and uh, way of dressing uniform civil code it's supposed to ensure women uh, women their rights but will it uh, um, will it ensure that kind of equality that we dream of because most of the people most of the minorities have a sense of loss of identity a sense of alienation india in india it happened after babri masjid maybe in the west it happened after september 11 it aggravated so will you cc you are mixing ensure you, you you are mixing too many issues then the reply will become very big so um, i will i will take uniform civil code uniform civil code the purpose is not to keep, to obliterate anybody's identity the purpose is not to create that uniform civil code cannot become basis of uh, that is the only instrument through which we can uh, create unity How, how how does that happen we have a uniform criminal law we don't have we have a, we have uniform commercial laws we have every law we have common and if you come to uh, civil court even uh, indian civil court is common only a portion of it that deals with marriage succession inheritance divorce things like that there the separate laws only a part of the civil code now i ask myself this question that the hindu code bill is not only applicable to hindus it is also applicable to sikhs is it or not yes Buddhist, in the same way the islamic Buddhist, yes exactly jains yes their identity has been obliterated no i i ask you why why i mean not just buddhist and sikhs and jains even among hindus the law has not been able to create unity of practice and ritual the the relations with which marriage is permissible from konkan down to uh, deep south if you tell suppose you tell a brahmin in in uttar pradesh that marriage with mother's brother happens then what the man in uh, ka, say in up the brahmin in up what he will say exactly he will say this is the this is the prime primary sin the definite path to hell yes even among the hindus it has not been able to create unity of, of custom and rituals then why anybody should be fearful so the purpose of uniform civil court is not to deal with the customs or the rituals of any community that they are not going to be regulated the purpose is to create uniform or similar rights and obligations which arise from marriage that's all so it is for instance i give you have uniform civil court but is uniform civil go to a civil court going to ask a muslim not to pay meher to his wife no they can't can't not possible because these things you cannot regulate law is not able to we only try to to create a semblance of stability because as far as personal matters are concerned for instance i'll tell you polygamy is not permissible under many laws many countries but the people have found a way out these things are very difficult to after all our supreme court has also recognized the living relationship and this man who has a living relationship he may be having a wife earlier 
so these things are not regulated by law the only thing which law can try to achieve is that the rights and obligations which arise from the fact of marriage they should be uniform additionally you want to do something you want to pay today there is no uniform civil court i ask you to conduct a survey how many muslim husbands pay maher to their wives the first thing which they do i i do not know about the south so much but north i know in fact it is of why i should say that i know most of the cases of marital dispute among the muslims it is only after the divorce that the question of maher is is disputed in the matter goes to the court why if you go by the true spirit of religion then maher must be paid before consummation of marriage mm -hmm. and not that people do not know about it people know about it they know that it is not permissible for me to touch her without paying maher so what the what the muslim bride groom does normally the first thing which he says to his wife before touching her he says maaf kar do and she is also ready to say because she she has knowingly married him she knows that the practice is such so instead of creating awareness about saying to the muslim uh, bride grooms muslim men that listen the religion demands that you should pay the money to the woman before marriage is consummated almost all uh, functions of the central government have a hindu ritual we often see persons holding constitutional posts flaunting saffron robes in public we see we have a prime minister who is the master of ceremony and uh, when the bhumi puja is conducted in ayodhya mm -hmm. so is in the apprehension natural mm -hmm. sir mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what apprehension apprehension that uh, this would lead to uh, I will, I will, I will, I will. I don't remember it, but I will read you. Uh, mm. Words from the Quran. The Quran in Surah Al-Baqar is talking about the episode which is mentioned in Bible also about that golden calf. If you have, you must have seen Bible. So the people, when Moses tells them. Uh, Uh, uh to make some sacrifice then they say that of what color it should be then according to quran quran says that it should be of saffron color the color which is most ple pleasing to eyes for you saffron is has religious overtones for me saffron is a color which is pleasing to eyes for me as an indian saffron is the color of renunciation saffron is the you know so, so, uh, we are strange people we say we have this tricolor flag the saffron is part is hindu the white part are others the green part are muslims without knowing anything about it saffron in indian culture means renunciation it means a spirit of sacrifice it means living for others not for yourself the white denotes peace green does not denote muslims green denotes prosperity and now you say that these functions start with the hindu rituals this thinking has been distorted as a result of the foreign rule under which we have who we have lived for centuries indian religion uh, if in fact this term we started using it in the sense of religion dharma is not religion dharma is way of life there are people uh, or i shall put it different 
if you are a hindu and you say that i do not believe in god i do not accept any of that and i am not just saying about you there was a great philosopher charak charak sahita is there he condemned everybody he profaned everything which indians held sacred is there any agency which can declare that if you say such things that you don't believe in god you don't believe in avatar you don't believe in this you don't believe in shiva you don't believe in rama you don't believe in krishna is there any agency which can declare that you have become a non hindu i'm asking you tell me if it were a religion then there should have been such agents there is no agents if i i am born in a muslim household if i deny any of the basic pillars which i have already described although today i mean if i deny any of the basic pillars then i will question myself whether i i am i am still a muslim if you don't believe in the divine nature of the jesus then you will ask yourself whether you are a christian where you really continue to be a christian these are not comparable the semitic religions or i would say the religions they have set of beliefs I mean, as far as uh, the clergy in india is concerned for them to declare somebody a kafir even denial of the basic principles is not necessary they can do it declare you kafir even without that that's a different matter but if it is a religion then there must be an agency to see that basic beliefs are not right it is not religion it is the way of life of india what it says it says bhartesu istriya purusho nana varna prakritite nana dev varchane yukta nana karmani kurvate the indian women and indian men they belong to different races they they practice different rituals and customs not just that they they worship different gods sir but there are critics who say that they you are eyeing a key post in delhi and that's why you are i'm eyeing the sangh parivar agenda i <laughs> well uh, 1986 when i resigned from the government and you know i was the youngest minister how many santo is do not fight the election but how many bjp mps were there in the house two, only two only two then i was i was eyeing for a position or i was giving up a position I, but they have right to their opinion they can say anything which they like i am sitting here in tirvendram if any decisions are to be taken they will be taken in delhi i hardly go to delhi so if i am eyeing something i to i to decided in 2007 that i don't want to be in active politics who does not know that 2014 so last I, i could have joined the union cabinet i did not everybody knows it it's a public knowledge so position if he, i became minister when i was just 25 years and few months old these things do not really fascinate me and even before that before i became a minister in up i think i had already i had already i it should not say with a sense of pride no i'm saying it with a sense of humility god was very kind when i was secretary of the union when i was president of the aligarh muslim university students union so that, i that think off, i go. was being uh, recognized almost nationally so these things i have seen all these things from from a very young age how these things can fascinate me at this stage now to i had gone to prime minister only to thank him because this whole process of enacting the law after sub after the supreme court judgment supreme court had declared triple divorce as unconstitutional against the teachings of the quran still triple divorce was happening why 
because in so supreme court cannot describe cannot prescribe how to deal with the offenders that is for the parliament so finally when one case happened in my old constituency i wrote a letter to the prime minister on which action was initiated and finally when it became law i went to thank him and that was only my third meeting with him and he asked me um, i had gone only to thank him but he told me that now this issue is over so uh, now if some responsibility you are asked to take over some i i smile and then he did not even tell me that is he wants to send me to kerala if he had some uh, some thing in his mind he he would have shared it with me no he did not third day i came to know that i have been appointed they these things but i should not go into detail they are welcome to entertain anything about me so they have already they uh, they have already uh, they have used a, I have everything in their vocabulary to condemn me, to criticize me. How can I help them? Okay, sir. Ask the uh, chancellor of the university. So, do will you advise the university to adopt a position similar to? It do. It's not a question of advising anybody. Even in Karnataka, you know, I have already told you, I am against. As far as the normal life is concerned, everyone must have the freedom. to wear whatever she or he wants to wear but when you join a profession when you join an educational institution then you become you sign certain documents and you give your consent to follow the discipline of the institution now if you accept the logic which they are giving now just imagine that is a young woman muslim ips officer can she perform her duties with uh, wearing veil well? and if you accept the argument it is intrinsic it is essential it is integral for the practice of islam she is not going to resign her job because she has children she has family she has to look after them she has pursued her career she won't resign she will continue she won't be able to wear hijab what kind of psychological dilemma you are going to place her in? all her life she will have this feeling that it because of my family because of my children all i could not practice my religion you and and muslim girls in the college wearing hijab for 6 years 8 years till they do phd till they do some some professional course when they come out which companies will be ready to give them jobs and how with if they are wearing for 8 years 9 years then they would also like to wear when they join they, they, when they pursue some career how many companies will be ready to to offer them job and how today we see and we see with great, we have this great feeling of pride when we see our young girls flying fighter jets So you want to close all these doors to Muslim young girls? So you have written to the CM on several issues like the in interference in universities. So yes. I'm asking whether will you write? I I still say that any executive interference in the universities, institutions of higher learning, stings in the nostrils of all those who attach certain sanctity to academic excellence. and uh, uh research and who believe that universities and colleges and classrooms they are actually market place of ideas and they should be allowed full freedom to blossom i even today i feel i feel that university must be totally free from the interference of the executive i do not say that there should be no political activity political parties should help the students in creating platforms where they can develop graces of mind and virtues of spirit universities should not be used to create 
the the cadre for the political parties who are summoned on the occasion of the public meetings to raise slogans in favor of some leaders or against some leaders that is not the role of the universities so finally one question also last day uttarakhand uh, chief minister said that if bjp is voted back to power in uttarakhand they would implement u- uniform civil code there so do you think that in the build up to 2024 polls uh, this will gather momentum i have already told you uh, even those who publicly oppose uniform civil code when they enter upon office they to- take oath of the constitution they will uphold the constitution and what the constitution says constitution makes it obligatory if not immediately but at least march towards having a uniform civil court how uniform civil court can be a subject of contention the only thing which we will have to ensure is that whenever we we frame this law we will ensure that the law does not ask anybody to do something which is prohibited by his faith or law should not stop anybody from doing something which is prescribed by her faith it's very easy after all i ask you after all, muslims are living in america or not they're living in europe or not they're living in turkey or not they all have uniform civil code so if that is essential to the practice of religion then why these people do not give, give a fatwa that it is not it is not halal for a muslim to go to america it to live there or you can go there only as a tourist why don't they give the fatwa the law commission says that there is no consensus so, on ucc and that is why are we ready as a society law culturally com- law commission's opinion i am not saying that i am merely saying that this host which the, they are using it as something to frighten the people this is not right because even as member of the assembly you take the oath that you will uphold the constitution when you oppose the constitutional objectives and constitutional goals you not only violate the constitutional morality but you are also violating the oath which you have taken but in a country like india is it possible to uh, implement this uniform civil code at a single you, stroke i have already told you i have already told you there is a there is a there is a uniform code for hindus sikhs jains buddhists their identity has been obliterated no but is it possible for a, at a single stroke so now single stroke is not there because triple divorce is already over and supreme court while while hearing the t- t- there are only there are two, only two features which are different from others triple divorce and polygamy triple divorce has gone one thing is left supreme court has said that we will hear it later the petition is alive don't forget after that what is left i i'm not talking about kerala i'm sure situation should be similar here but you come to a wedding in north india same songs are sung whether it is a hindu wedding uh, of a hindu bride and bridegroom or a muslim bride or bride same kind of custom same kind of ritual almost if you maybe in western up uh something may be different but if you go to eastern up even the food is same i mean necessarily non vegetarian stall, stalls will be there vegetarian stalls will be there everything in any case amir khosro songs which were composed by amir khosro to be sung at the time of the marriage they are sung across the communities kahe ko bhi ahi i do not know whether the south also it is uh, it, is it has up. been it has been a, yeah. adopted kahe ko bhi ahi bidesh sun babul mein everyone and right from pakistan exactly right from pakistan up to vindhyachal 
every community. They sing the same songs, same customs. How we are different? Then why is there so much of opposition against uniform civil code? What will you say to the students who are protesting in Karnataka? Yeah, to, the students, to the students, I will come later. Don't, don't mix up with the uniform civil code. But uniform civil code, I will say, at the time of the... when they, so, I don't want to name anybody, but when there was a movement demanding partition of the country, what was being said? Muslim identity will be in danger, Muslim religion will be in danger, Muslim culture will be in danger, Muslim language will be in danger, everything will be in danger. And ultimately what happened? After 30 years, people from you have not been affected by the, by the tragedy of partition. No. In northern India, it was not only the partition of the country, the families were partitioned. And it did not take even 30 years for people generally to realize what a blunder we have committed. Even Pakistanis, a country which could not survive even for 25 years, they had partitioned India and they themselves were partitioned after 25 years. The rest of the country, I do not know how long it is going. We want them to last. We do not have any wish to disintegrate them because not does not suit us. But I have my doubts. As far as these students are concerned, they are young girls. They must, they must, they must concentrate on their studies today. The sky is the limit. You know, last three months I have attended four convocations. It was such a happy, such a happy experience. The gold medalist and the award winners, 70% plus were girls. And in the university where I thought the number of girls will be, will be, will be small. Veterinary University in Vienna. You have to deal with animals. I had gone the, with this impression in my mind that here the number of girl students will be less. I was told they are 73%. And among the gold medalists and the winners of awards, <laughs> why not was one place where there was only one boy. All, all medals, all awards were won by girls. And I must also say here, although I do not look at it from that angle, never. But when the names were being announced, the number of Muslim girls was not less than number of girls belonging to other communities. This is not a controversy. I am convinced in my mind. This is a sinister design. This is a, this is a conspiracy. They want to push back. If the Muslim girls, they will start losing career prospects. Their interest in education will diminish. But whose so conspiracy? Whose con who's who's cons conspiracy? Whose conspiracy? Those who, are those who are saying that it is essential and intrinsic to the practice of Islam. Why Islam do they, does not say so. Why do they want it? They want it. Why they want it triple divorce? So sir. answer is there. I have already told you they used to bury young girls. They want to suppress, they want to oppress, they want to dominate over women. So, and sir. that is why they want their interest. If the career prospects will not be there, interest in education will diminish and they will be forced into the four walls of the house. So, do you, are you saying that they are not aware about the choices they are making or are they No, no, they are very well aware. This is their objective. When you say that is a conspiracy, they are not are the cons? Conspiracy? Why this is, if not conspiracy, then what it is? Were they not aware in 1986 when they were saying that triple divorce is a divine law? And what they said in 2017? They said that yes, we recognize that this is innovation. We ourselves want to finish it. You don't interfere. We will, we will organize conferences. We will give a call to socially boycott those who resort to triple divorce. 
why they took 30 years to realize because now situation went out of their control now their arguments were not working it is the same it is their conspiracy ayodhya used to have it's an out of context question ayodhya used to have a temple and a mosque side by side they used to live no, in harmony no never 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 outside the mosque the one platform was allotted platform there was no building on it when the dispute more than 200 years back is started then one platform was given to them not temple and in there. mathura in mathura you yes, are saying yes yes yes, yes. so, so they what lived is in your harmony. question they eh? lived in harmony they used to live in i harmony. do not know if we you know when when you see a mosque and a temple and a church and a synagogue is standing side by side in kerala it brings very pleasant memories to your mind yes why it brings pleasant memory because temple was already there the jews came here in the first in the year when solomon when the solomon's temple was destroyed these jews after some time go to the ruler and they say give us a plot of land we want to build our place over uh, no we give, we need a plot of land he says for what for building a place of worship this big campus it has only one uh, one building for the worship of god you build by the side of it then the christians come he says you build by the side and the muslims come he says build by the side of it. when you see these four places of worship in kerala they bring pleasant memories to your mind yes when you go to tirshur you you come to know that a hindu raja had built the mosque you feel so happy yes. but in up in northern india they remind you of the times when places of worship were being destroyed leave i do not want to go They, i can quote so many uh, instances but the molana alimia who was the president of the personal law board his own father which means only about 100 years back his famous book which first he wrote in arabic then it was translated into urdu one whole chapter is devoted and with a sense of pride these were the temples which were replaced by mosque then what they remind you of? they don't bring any pleasant when no you so it is not right to say that they, lived in they, they were they were living in harmony yes in kerala if you say about it it is true not about you up or not just up northern india they remind you of the times when you were being humiliated your places of worship were being destroyed religion does not ask you to do this but unfortunately this was the methodology of the times that if you want to rule over a people first you destroy first you demoralize them and what is the best instrument to demoralize them the destroy the places or icons wish they invoke for their safety and then give the argument that these icons cannot save themselves how they will save you so please do not compare yes kerala if you say i feel so happy i am ready to go every day to see these icons i love them so uh, i think we'll wind up sir thank, thank you. you for giving us so much of time and talking in such pleasant terms thank you very much thank you sir thank you. if you like this video please like share and subscribe to our channel